Well, friends, it's that time of year where Angel fans look for the good because the team's not so good. They lost to the Orioles, but there were some good things that we noticed, and we know you didn't watch the game. We watched it for you. So it's time to get Locked On with Mike and John, and this is Locked On Angels. You are Locked On Angels, your daily Los Angeles Angels podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SiriusXM by searching Locked On Angels. And of course, the best way to help us out is by giving us a rate and a review. We love five stars. And those watching on YouTube, make sure that you're subscribed and click that bell to be notified every time a new episode drops. And today's show is brought to you by the Sleeper app. You can swing for the fences on Sleeper Picks, and you can win up to 100 times your money. Download the Sleeper app right now. Use our promo code Locked On, and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. There are some terms and conditions that do apply see sleepers terms of use for details currently operational in over 30 states check out sleeper today thanks for being here for this episode of lockdown angels where it's your team every day you've got the frisch brothers here with you aka the super halo bros my name is john and that's my brother mike and my name is mike and welcome back to my brother john you've got power hey, you've got power got, <laughs> we've got power again yes that was a weird uh that was a weird sunday night but uh here we are i'm back Happy to be here. Happy to be talking Angels baseball. No matter how much they disappoint us, Michael, we have to look for the good with this team. Hey, uh, on today's show, we're going to talk about who the Angels have in Nolan Shanuel as a player. And, of course, there's some Shohei Otani updates regarding the UCL damage and also an oblique issue. We're going to get into all of that later on. But first, Mike, let's talk about that game against the Orioles. It was a 6-3 to loss against the first-place Orioles. And we did have some news right before the game started. Yeah, there was an oblique issue, as you mentioned, with Shohei Otani. He, it happened during batting practice. We'll share some more details uh, later on in the show. Let me give you a bit of the play-by-play from the game. Kyron Paris, John, actually looks like a major league player. He played shortstop for the Angels last night, had a diving stop in the first inning. It, Johnny, he reminded me of another guy that played short, uh, hmm. Zach Neto, ah, who, yeah, who actually is starting a, a rehab assignment. So yes. hopefully we'll get to see him within the next few days can't wait to until he gets back we're gonna actually talk about him later this week i think he's the fire starter for this team johnny they're yeah. 10 games over 500 when zach netto is in this lineup uh angels got the first run in the bottom of the second mickey moniak had a double michael stefanik scored he reached on a walk johnny i really like michael stefanik i really like him i'd love to see him actually more involved in this lineup i don't know if his role could be kind of another outfielder that's kind of filling in, but I think he just needs it bats because the guy can actually swing it. He'd be a great piece off the bench for sure. Mike, I got to thinking during this game, we look at Kyron Paris at shortstop and Zach Neto will be back soon. Do you think we could see Neto at shortstop and Paris at second next year? Because I know Drury plays second and first Drury's played third base Mm. in the, in the past. And you can't count on Anthony Noabla Ingles Rendon uh, to play third. So perhaps Drury could move to first. And when they don't want Shanuel in the lineup versus a lefty, um, maybe they could play Drury at first base. Or I should say Drury at third. Yeah. And then at first base, when there's a lefty on the mound, that's a possibility. But I'd love to see Neto and, and Paris up the middle next year. Would you? Yeah, I think that that could be a really, I think, athletic up the middle, a great defensive up the middle. And Paris has shown to handle the bat really, really well. He's hitting the ball hard, man. He has. He really has. And perhaps even with Drury at third base, we need a third baseman. And Johnny, on on a side note, let's just make a commitment. If Rendon's not going to talk to the media, we're not going to talk about him, right? Like, (laughs) let's not talk about him. But but let let me be very, very clear. That guy needs to be off the team, right? That guy needs to be kicked off the team just because we're not talking about him doesn't mean we don't want him off this team because I think right. he's just now it's getting silly. It's getting ridiculous and it's yeah. not fun. It's not fun to laugh at anymore. It's not fun to talk about. So we're not going to talk about him if he's not going to talk about it. But I will say this DFA. That's what I will say. Yes. So uh, Brandon Drury did get a home run in this game along with Randall Grichuk. Drury, 20 home runs. Johnny, I think he's probably yeah. the best Perry Manassian signing and move that he's made because this guy has been really, really good. Somebody that you actually called for in the offseason that the Angels should sign. Yeah, and and remember, he had about a month gone from the team as well. So I'm sure uh, we would have seen seen more home runs in that sense. But yeah, he's been a nice pickup. Mike, I got to talk about Kenny Rosenberg in this one. Six innings pitched, seven hits, three runs, 87 pitches. Here's Can I just tell you what I was thinking like as this game started? Sure. I know that it was a spot start 
Chase Silseth, of course, is going through the concussion protocol. I imagine we might not see Chase back this season just to let him go through that whole process. Getting hit in the back of the head with that throw was not a good thing. And Kenny got his spot start in this one. And to me, my initial thought was, oh, I like Kenny. He's he's a great hand to have in the minor leagues when you need somebody to come up and give a spot start or you need somebody to pitch out of the bullpen as he's done in the past. He's pitched both as a starter and a reliever for the big club. And I'm thinking, Oh, this is, this is fine. But then I got to thinking, isn't there anybody they'd like to give a look to hmm. more than Kenny when these games don't matter? So as I'm thinking that I look up and Kenny has gone through six innings, pitched three earned runs, 87 pitches, a quality start, Mike. And I'm like, this is the first place Orioles team. What the heck? Yeah. Like, yeah. how did he how did he accomplish this? And he really only had that one bad inning where the Orioles had some situational hitting. They're hitting it between second and first and hitting it where the gap in the infield is. And and that was where his three earned runs came from. But you take away that, and it's like that's a decent start from Kenny Rosenberg. So perhaps they have something in him and perhaps mm. this was the look they wanted to give to somebody. Then I got to thinking, well, who else can they give a look to right in the minor leagues, considering how many guys we traded away. But yeah, all that to say props to Kenny Rosenberg. I thought he did awesome. And for a spot start where you're thinking, oh, couldn't they give somebody else a look? This was definitely worth a look. I think here's a name from the past. Jerome Williams. That's what yes. this spot start reminded me of. Remember he yeah. would come in and he would, pitch really well. And we're like, how come he's not in the starting rotation? Well, because the starting rotation had like Dan Heron and Zach Greinke and all of that. Yeah. So in a perfect world, in a, in a decent rotation, Kenny Rosenberg comes in and spot starts for you and maybe makes five to seven, maybe even 10 starts a year. And yeah. so I, I think that they have maybe something in him. I think the uh, bullpen and then starter and then bullpen and the up and down, it's kind of messed with him this year. And so it was great to see him kind of put it all together against the Orioles, even though it was a loss, the bullpen couldn't hold it for him. Uh, Reyes comes in in the seventh and gives up a three run shot. He's that type of guy that just reminds me of the quad a angels, right? Like this is why mm. he can't stay in the major leagues because he either is really, really good or he just falls off a cliff. But he Tony, looks great in those first two outs, and then yeah. two guys get on, and Gunnar Henderson takes yeah. it for a ride. So it's like, how did how did you get to two outs? And <laughs> come on, dude. <laughs> and that's the story all season long, right? Even Phil Nevin said in his interview last night, he said we just got to two outs, and then we just can't close down innings. No. And then oh, the, the the quote that I hated was like, "But we were really good up until that point." Yeah, but that point like <laughs> doesn't matter, Phil. Phil. All of it matters, right? Johnny, here's what I thought was really interesting about last night's game was the news before the game that Tim Salmon and Chuck Finley are going to be a part of the Angels staff as quote-unquote advisors. I'm doing air yes. quotes for those on the audio side. Uh, for the foreseeable, foreseeable future, they're going to be in uniform. They're going to be in the dugout. They're going to be extra eyes and ears. Johnny, what do you think this is? Is this just kind of a tip of the cap to two really great Angel Hall of Famers? Or is there something more here? The Angel fans on Facebook are going to love this. They're going to go <laughs> ballistic because they've been calling for this for 20 years, Mike. No, probably more like 10 years. But listen, having having Tim Salmon and Chuck Finley, two guys who are Angels Hall of Famers, they're in the dugout, they're giving advice. I can't see how this is a bad thing. Now, Phil Nevin did present yeah. it to Bally Sports when he was interviewed as his idea and likened it to when he invited guys to – spring training to come hang out and come be around the players. I don't think it's a bad thing. I do think it should have happened a month ago when Agreed. they really needed it. But you and I comment all the time how when we listen to Mark Langston on the radio mm. or we listen to Gooby yep. on the broadcast, those guys just have such a knack for identifying what a pitcher is doing wrong on the mound, whether that's the opposing pitcher or an Angels pitcher, you know, dropping a shoulder or doing whatever it might be. They have such a knack for identifying that stuff. And, and even Tim Salmon on the post-game show, he recognizes things. Uh, Chuck Finley, I think, is going to be a great addition to the dugout because he he will be able to recognize things and help out pit, help out hitters identify things in pitchers, too. Yeah, so yeah. I, don't, I don't see this as a problem. It does make me wonder where this directive came from because you know Artie, most of the time, I know he hasn't retired numbers or honored a lot of previous players, but you know he likes his former Halos. That's why he wanted to bring in Joe Madden, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I'm wondering whose directive this was. I don't know if this is an indication of where the team's going, if they want to get back to more of a, 
an old school social ball kind of thing. All that to say, I don't have a problem with it. I think it's great. Why not? Because they're not playing for anything right now. So get those guys in the dugout to be around the young guys that are going to contribute to this team next season. What are your thoughts on this? I think the benefit is going to be Chuck Finley working with Reed Detmers and working with Mm. Sandoval, perhaps even working with Tyler Anderson because Chuck Finley was a dominant left-handed pitcher and he's pitched at Angel Stadium. He knows the ins and outs of that stadium. And so perhaps there's something he can teach them. I, I think that the Angels might just be stuck in numbers and metrics and analytics. And it might just be that they need to bring in some guys that are really well respected, not just personal. And this is, I said something like this uh, about Phil Nevin on yesterday's show. I think there's personal respect, but I do think that there may be some professional respect that's lacking with Phil Nevin. And I think with Tim Salmon, and I think with, with Chuck Finley, two guys that have done it, Tim Salmon's won a world series. I think that there might be some professional respect that they have for these guys. They're going to listen to these guys and they can come in and say, Hey, you are doing this or you're not doing that. And here's the best way forward. And here's something that you can identify. And I think that it's only going to be a positive to have these guys around because as we've mentioned, this, this team needs more baseball guys around Mm -hmm. because when the baseball guys are making baseball decisions, it actually is, Good, like good things, good things happen. And so if Perry Manassian can just do some of the moving and shaking and getting the right pieces and allow the team to actually do what they can do and allow the coaching to do what they can do, I do think we need new coaching, but allow yeah. those guys to come in and do what they can do. I think this team could actually see uh, uh, an up and to the right movement sooner rather than later. Yeah, I agree. And again, we've been calling for coaching to change. So to have these guys in the dugout is a nice half measure in that direction. It's not the the full send that we would like, but right. but there you go. Hey, the Angels are back at it against the Orioles tonight, 6.38 Pacific time. You can catch every pitch of the Angels hometown broadcast on SiriusXM with the SXM app. All you got to do is search Angels. And coming up on Locked on Angels, we got an Otani update for you. We heard from his agent, Nez Bolello, about his UCL stuff and what he might be doing next season. We're going to talk about all of that coming right up. Locked on Angels is brought to you by the Sleeper app. We've been talking about the Sleeper app on Locked on Angels for the last few months, and it's actually a really great app. It's a fantasy baseball app, but you can actually win money. In fact, you can swing for the fences on the Sleeper app and win up to 100 times your money, and it's really simple to use, Johnny. You can just pick out a player and then decide if they're going to overperform or underperform. It's it's simple. You and I can do that. It's really easy to use, right? Listen, my my fantasy baseball league ended already because our manager wanted to focus on fantasy football. So I got to the playoffs and then my team totally tanked from that point. So uh, to have more fantasy baseball in my life where I can win money because I didn't win any money in my regular <laughs> fantasy league. Yeah, this is great, Mike. I'm all for sleeper. Yeah, so download the Sleeper app today. When you do, use our promo code Locked On at sign up, and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Can't go wrong, so go and download it right now. Remember, when you sign up, Locked On is the promo code. It's our gift to you. You should check out Sleeper today. Thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. Locked On Everydayers, join us every day this week. We're recapping the games against the Orioles. We're talking about the future of this team and we're trying to give you the silver linings wherever we can and watching the game so you don't have to but if you want to listen to the game you can always do so with the sxm app on sirius xm you can catch every pitch of the angels hometown broadcast because the angels are playing the o's at 6 38 pacific time tonight again sirius xm the sxm app just search angels let's talk about a silver lining johnny and that silver lining is nolan shonowell he has been somebody that we've been really excited about he's playing first base for us and he came into last night's game with a pretty impressive slash line but there's a number that we're gonna have to talk about because this is the thing that everybody's concerned about so yeah he came into last night with this slash line 273 429 a 295 slugging and a Mm -hmm. 724 OPS in 12 games and 44 at bats. So there's a lot to be impressed about with Sean Owell as he's come up to the majors. He's obviously moved through the minor leagues very quickly, was just drafted this year. There's this narrative, Johnny, in drafting and in the major league baseball, you know, organizations and upper management 
that that first baseman shouldn't be drafted really high because they have a really low ceiling. Uh, th- there's there's a narrative, and, and Fangraphs had a great article about this, that first basemen are kind of like the running backs in the NFL. Like you, hmm. you, you get one, you have them, and then you use them for a while, and then you toss them. But I love I loved this little piece in that article on Fangraphs is they said guys like Paul Goldschmidt, Reese, uh, Reese Hoskins, and Pete Alonzo have actually changed the narrative. And then recent draft picks like like – Spencer Torkelson and Andrew Vaughn have really helped teams to go, Hey, maybe, maybe we need to go get a first baseman and maybe we can get a first baseman in the first round. So that's some of the perspective, but despite that, Johnny, uh, Shawnawell has moved up through the ranks pretty quickly. He actually, uh, talked about how he was able to do that. Why don't you share that quote with us? Yeah. He said, everything's a little bit faster each step of the way. When I first got to Arizona to when I went to Alabama and now here, Each step gets a little bit faster. You just try to slow yourself down, a little adjustments, things like that. And I love this. What has allowed Shanuel to move so quickly, his ability to get on base. He actually told Jeff Fletcher (laughs) from the OC Register that in college, he would leave the batting cage if he swung at a ball or took a strike. I love love that. that mentality. Love that. And I think that is so key to why he's so good at swinging at pitches in the zone. Over time... He's got an ability to separate balls and strikes with great clarity. And so far, that skill has translated to the majors. And you and I have noticed that when Shanuel gets upset, it's usually because he took a pitch that wasn't a strike and got called a strike, or he saw a pitch that was a a strike and he didn't go for it. So you can see that he has that recognition even at the major league level. And that honestly just helps his on base percentage. He's going to draw a lot of walks. He's not going to get himself out at swinging at junk. He's going to swing on stuff in the zone, which is something that's really hard to teach Mike. And I want to come back to that in just a minute, but why don't you continue? Yeah. You mentioned Johnny that he gets mad at himself in the batting cage. And what I read into those words is accountability. And I think that that's Mm. what this angels team has lacked. There's no hmm. accountability for this team. Yeah. And that's why I like Sean Well, because he's somebody that's like, I'm going to hold myself accountable. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to do that. I'm going to hold myself accountable so that I can actually be better. And that's one of the reasons why he has the batting stance that he yeah. has, because yeah. it has allowed him to see the pitches a whole lot better. And it's allowed him to make contact on some of the really tough pitches when they're throwing like down and in. So he's got this really big leg kick, just like Zach Neto, which I find interesting that, They've been critiqued about that, but however, these two guys have figured it out in the major leagues, he, and he's had it since his freshman year of college. Yeah. He said, I, I didn't hit many home runs in high school, and I felt like I needed to make a change to unlock some power, and it was his hitting coach in high school that actually told him, hey, you need this leg kick. That actually will be really, really helpful, and it opened up everything for him. It said it allowed him to get his hip moving, his back knee moving. It allowed him to get his hands extended. Uh, Sean Well has been compared to Craig Council. I don't don't know if you remember him. He was managing yeah. the, the Brewers, but he had right. that high batting stance, right? Yeah. Jeff McNeil on the Mets. He's been he's been compared to him uh, above the waist. And then I, I love this critique of somebody. They said, but he's got like Jeff Bagwell stance below the waist. <laughs> and so if you yeah. remember Bagwell with the Astros, kind of open kind of moving he had kind of a funky batting stance but the the dude's in the hall of fame so it worked for him but this batting stance actually allows him to get to those pitches that are really difficult to get to and it Mm. allows him to make contact but what it's done johnny and this is where the concern is and why his slugging percentage is down is that it hasn't translated well to extra base extra base hits uh maybe more than like a traditional swing would uh going into last night sean noel had 12 big league hits and 11 of them were singles so there's a lot of questions john if this guy is actually going to hit for power and i think that those questions are justified however i think that this guy just needs more time to develop right yeah you look at somebody like like luisa rise and his batting average of course he he was in the minor since age 17 debuted at 22 and a half years old uh he's got five years of development and i think about shanuel and the fact that he's 21 mike i looked at him last night in the game and like he's a skinny kid like yeah He's, he's just a skinny kid. And here's the thing that we need to take away from this conversation. You can't teach awesome plate discipline. You can help players get better at it. Yeah. You can help them 
recognize pitches better. You can figure out things to help them do that. But when you have like an elite pitch recognition like Shanuel does or an understanding of the strike zone like he does where you know when to swing and you know when not to swing, that's really hard to teach yes. as a skill. You, again, you can develop it if it's already there. But here's the thing. That's something that Shanuel brings to the table that any major league team would crave on their offense. Now, again, I mentioned he's skinny. He's 21 years old. He's more athletic than me, so skinny is not an insult. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is there's a world where this guy adds power. Yeah. Everybody who comes up to the big leagues in their early 20s is going to add power across their career. You look at Mike Trout and the way he stole 40 plus bags his first season. He doesn't do that anymore, but he sure hits for a lot of power. And that's the trade off he's made over the course of his career. You look at Joe Adele, and I think Joe Adele added like 20 pounds of muscle over the offseason because he hit the gym. He felt like, hey, if I can just add some muscle, that's really going to help out my power bat, the power bat I already do have, mm -hmm. and it's going to make it even more powerful. The same can be said for Nolan Shanuel. He's got great plate recognition swinging at stuff in the strike zone. And I think the fact that he's not hitting for power now, that's easily fixable. All you got to do is have that guy hit the gym and be mindful of his swing because as you add more bulk and more power, that's going to change your swing a little bit. And so if he can maintain a good balance of adding some muscle and some strength to his swing, I think he's going to have a lot of success and that pitch recognition is going to take him a long way for the Angels. Johnny, Shohei Otani's agent uh, stepped in front of the media yesterday and said some really interesting things. He said Shohei is in a good place. He's in good spirits. People understand the situation that he's in, and he's going to be fine. There's been an outpouring of love and well wishes, and they've been overwhelmed by that. They appreciate that. Shohei deeply appreciates that. He also said that it's likely Shohei will need some kind of procedure done, but mm -hmm. they're still weighing the options as to what needs to be done. The ligament itself, and I thought this was really interesting, the ligament itself that Shohei has, the, the graph as it was shown, uh, the, where it was repaired before in 2018, still intact. So, th yeah. so that's actually really, really good news. The injury is in a different spot. And and here, here's what I thought was really interesting. He said, Shohei's going to be in somebody's lineup next year. He's mm -hmm. going to be DHing when the bell rings. And he's actually going to be Shohei Otani. Like, he's not maybe not going to pitch next year, but he's going to continue to hit and pitch. Like, there's no question in his mind that he's going to come back and he's going to do both. I thought it also was interesting that he said that they weren't bothered by Perry Manassian letting the media know hmm. that there was that request of an MRI of imaging and, and both Shohei and his agent said, no, we're not going to do that. He actually said, I'm not bothered by that. In fact, our relationship with the angels is strong and it's good. And he did say that he is not going to comment on if Shohei is going to negotiate a short-term deal with incentives or a long-term deal in the off season. We're going to get there. And when we get there, you'll find out when we sign the contract. So I, I, I get it. I, a lot of privacy and they have the right to do that. But Johnny, in, any response to what the, the agent said about Shohei, any response to the short-term long-term deal? Um, do you think it's good for the angels to maybe try to get a short-term deal with Shohei and then renegotiate? Like tell me your thoughts after what you heard from yesterday. Yeah, so Nez Valella was talking about the tear was at like the top of the UCL previously, and that tear didn't re-tear, like you mentioned. Yeah. That's still intact. He said this was like the very bottom of the UCL. So it's a new spot. Right. And it that was actually, he said it's best case scenario for this situation that they are in. And I appreciated the words that Bolello had to say. Mike, I, I think about what's going to happen with Shohei Otani, and the whole conversation around his contract just got way more intriguing mm. because, <clears throat> because of what happened. And I think about teams who had designs on signing him long-term. I think those teams are still going to try to sign him long-term, Mike. I, mm. I understand that like perhaps there's a world where somebody wants to offer him a very expensive short-term deal or something like that. I get that, but the reality is, 
when you have the chance to jump at Shohei Otani and make him part of your team for the next five to 10 years, I don't think that goes away with this injury. Yeah, Mm. he doesn't pitch for a year. He DHs. He's going to DH and and still rack up home runs and and triples and stolen bases and things like that. I mean, we've seen him do it before. We've seen Bryce Harper also have success with his torn UCL. Like, this can be done, and if anybody can do it, it's Shohei because he's already done it. Now, having said all that, I understand that this might put the Angels in a good position just because Otani's gone through it with them before. I think that that actually curries some favor with the Angels. And so, again, I think the Angels or any other team would try to sign him to something beyond five years. They want to lock this guy down. I get that. Is it going to be a good thing for the Angels? Well, I'm of two minds there. Yes, because Otani gives you the opportunity to win. Yes, because of the revenue that Otani brings in is good for dispersing among the team. At the same time, Mike, this last month has been absolutely brutal. Yeah. And it is the results and the accumulation of all of the decision making over the last 10 years. Why do you think we're just now getting guys that we're excited about watching? Because the Angels haven't had a farm system for 10 years. Yeah, we've mm-hmm. had our Jared Walshes and our and our David Fletchers along the way and, and our recent pitching with like Reed Detmers. We've had those guys along the way. But what we're seeing right now is the culmination of every bad decision John Carpino and Artie Marino have made over the last 10 years. And if they get their quote unquote golden goose in Otani for another long-term contract, I see Artie staying. I don't see things changing. I don't see a turnaround with this organization as much as Perry Manassian might try to sway that. I see Perry Manassian getting let go and another GM coming in, another manager, and then we go through the same cycle over and over again. Don't get me wrong. I want Shohei Otani on this team because it puts the Angels in a much better chance to win. The downside, and this is what I want to clarify, is that if Artie Marino gets Otani back, my concern and my prediction is that Artie goes, all right, I did it. I'm good. We're yep. done. Let's go. All yep. right, what are we going to do now? You know, and, and, and that's where I think this ends. What do you think? I 100% agree with you. In fact, I said that on yesterday's show. I, I want Otani back. Love Otani. I love that he's been out there. I love that he's fighting. I love that he's still playing. He's still engaged, even though the, the, the team is terrible. But I don't want to see him re-sign with the Angels, and then the Angels go, well, all right, we're good. And then they yeah. just kind of piece a team together. Do the I same thing see they him, with Trout. Like. Right? I want to see him actually come back, and then the team actually do what is necessary to make this team really, really good. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I wonder if there's a world where we have seen Shohei Otani's really great years and then the injury to the UCL and the oblique issue. Maybe we're starting to move into the Otani years where he's a bit hurt and he's a bit roughed up and maybe it might be wise to let him go. I would love to see him for the rest of his career with the Angels, but I don't want to see him beat up like Mike Trout and I don't want to see the Angels not do anything else because they signed him and then they went, all right, cool, hands off, right? Right. With Otani, I think the workload was totally different this year too. It was the first year they yeah. did that, not a six-man rotation kind of yeah. thing. Uh, real quick, if Artie does get Otani back, that does incentivize him to sell the team eventually at a right. higher price because right. you know now he's not going to get as much as he did last year. Right. Hey, thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. The Angels play the O's tonight at 638, and you can catch every pitch of the Angels hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Angels. Hey, give us a follow at Locked On Angels on Twitter and at Super Halo Bros on Twitter and Instagram and connect with us there. Mike, what do we have on deck for Wednesday's show? Johnny, are the Halos an attractive destination for free agents, as we just talked about? Like, if they re-sign huh. Shohei, they got to have other players, right? Because we can't keep doing the same old thing. So let's talk about if this place is attractive or not. We're going to talk about that tomorrow on Locked On Angels. Thanks for being here with us, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Until then, my name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. I went that whole episode without saying Baltimore's, Mike. (laughs) Who's going to call it out? Congratulations.